This is Ann Webb, and I'm here with Dr. Gerald Bukoff. This is the Animal Intuitive Show, and I'm the Animal Intuitive. Today, uh, I am very excited to have, have Dr. Gerald Bukoff here. Dr. Bukoff is a respected veterinarian. He is uh, well versed in holistic veterinary care, he owns his own practice. Um, he also is the creator of Dr. B's Longevity Dog and Cat Food. And he's also served as the president of the Northern New Jersey Medical Association and uh, Veterinary Medical Association, and as vice president and president of the American, <clears throat> excuse me, Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. So I'm excited to have Dr. B, as he, as he is referred to here, to talk about how you can keep your pet living much uh, longer and healthier lives. So thank you for being here, Dr. B. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. We'll mention that my pets have actually been uh, been treated by Dr. B and um, they have eaten his food as well. So they're in the other room watching excitedly. That's smart. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering, Dr. B, if we could just start off by talking about how you got into the field of veterinary medicine. Veterinary medicine in general was um, high school and I really had no contact with veterinarians. It was a, um, a career counseling uh, test that I took. And that was one of the three areas that they, they thought I would be good at. Uh, I love to be outdoors. I love to love animals, love people, love science. And so it was just natural. So I spent um, a vacation and this is all, you know, a lot of ju um, junior high schoolers and high schoolers come to me and ask what, you know, how do I see if it's something good for me. And I tell them to do what I did, spend a, a day, spend a week. I spent, uh, what, about four days with this veterinarian in Baltimore. And the first, I don't know, half hour I was there, I said, this is definitely my career. But okay. um, just to spend a few days, I just learned so much and it, it reinforced that feeling. That's, so. that's great. Uh, it's great advice for people who want to get into the field, um, what a great opportunity too, to just see it live um, and see if it's something that you'd be interested in. So anyone who's watching with kids or people who maybe are in high school and they're junior high, do that. Yeah, and they're welcome to, to contact me. And what I like to do also have them spend a couple of days with me seeing alternative medicine, a holistic medicine. And then I asked them to also see a, a conventional veterinarian as well so that they can get the full breadth of uh, clinical medicine, clinical small animal right. um, practice. Okay, well, and that brings me to the question, how did you end up in the field of holistic veterinary medicine? Well, as all the, I don't know how many holistic vets there are, there's only maybe, um, perhaps a couple hundred that are really have given up conventional medicine mostly, although I do practice conventional medicine, uh, but in a holistic way. For example, I'll do antibiotics, but I'll always do it with probiotics. I'll, always, I'll give vaccines, but I'll always give homeopathic remedies to counteract the side effects. But uh, that was a good question. How did I get into that? And it wasn't my choice um, or it wasn't my I, I apparently was predisposed to being open to alternative uh, medicine because I went to veterinary school in India and there was a lot of uh, alternative medicine. In fact, they taught conventional medicine because uh, university that I was at was set up by University of Illinois vet school and all the professors were taught at University of Illinois, at Ohio State, at Kansas State, all the vet schools here. So, and we had the same books, the same courses. Uh, the thing was that um, um, they would run out of, when it came to clinics, they would revert to homeopathy and herbs and things like that, even though they were teaching conventional. It was very interesting. and. Part of it was they ran out of reagents for their machines and for this and that. And because uh, it's, it's not a wealthy country, uh, actually now that vet school has lots of money and they've built it up big and they have all modern machinery. But uh, it was good that they weren't built up back then and that we learned to 
look at things and feel things intuitively mm -hmm. and not uh, not necessarily rely on laboratory tests and, and x-rays, but to use our fingers, use our noses, you know, use our ears and uh, learn that way. So um, how did I get into conventional, into holistic medicine, which by definition is conventional plus alternative? Mm -hmm. Back in 80, 80 is when I graduated, in about 82, I started to get a lot of I don't know, phone calls, discussions, articles given to me. Uh, Dr. B, aren't there other ways you can help my pet? Uh, it's still scratching, even though you gave the antibiotics, then once they stop, they itch again. Um, their teeth, you clean them, but then they get bad again. Um, you know, this cancer is not responding. <coughs> there must be other treatments, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just listened to my clients and they led me toward conventional medicine. I, I just realized I only had so many tools in my toolbox from vet school and um, through uh, holistic medicine, I added more. Okay. If you want to be a veterinarian, you have to love medicine and science. You have to love people. And obviously you have to be passionate about helping animals. Yes. Okay, not just love them, but really want to help them right. and give, give your heart and your soul and your life to them. So uh, that's important. And as far as getting into holistic medicine, no matter what vet school you come out of, uh, at least to date, uh, they all teach conventional medicine. So holistic medicine, you have to learn on your own. Mm -hmm. And I came to it by listening to my clients asking for it. And uh, because they've heard through magazines, through radio shows, TV shows, that there's other ways of treating things. Why don't you learn about it? So um, I'm sure these are other questions you were going to ask. So what I did <laughs> in 1996 is I joined the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, which is um, an international organization, actually. Uh, it now has about, I think about 1,100, if I'm not, right, if I'm not wrong, um, veterinarians, and they're in it, every country. <coughs> Most are in the United States and Canada. But um, uh, through that, first of all, going to the conference in 1996 and going to almost everyone since, I've taken lots of lectures and learned so much that way, but also learned about courses so many of you might have heard of Richard Pitcairn, who is the father of veterinary homeopathy. I took my homeopathy course with him. Um, Dr. William Inman uh, taught me laser and uh, also uh, chiropractic. And then in many courses, sometimes weekends, sometimes um, going away or, or just webinars, I learned a lot of other things like aromatherapy, um, uh, laser, uh, well, more laser, ozone, um, fecal transplants, um, just all kinds of other modalities that we use. Uh, Reiki, uh, I learned that through a human Reiki course. Mm -hmm. And um, there's just so many things that, that you can use and you have to uh, oh, and of course, acupuncture and chiropractic, uh, acupuncture and, and uh, Chinese herbs. Uh, I took a course with uh, Mona Boudreau out in Illinois. Um, and a lot, of, I also learned just through books. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Through, through those things, you can really broaden your horizon so much. I had a lot of people come to me and say in my uh, Facebook group that they were interested in knowing more about raw feeding and things like that. So I thought of Dr. B because he has created this uh, dog food, Dr. B's longevity. So I'm wondering, Dr. B, how did you go into that field and, and tell us about that, the importance of it and, and um, just help people understand more about that? Right, well, even before I joined the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, I learned uh, about raw feeding and that there are there are so many aspects to raw feeding. So just globally, you're staying away from 
things like uh, ch chemicals like uh, preservatives, you're staying away from um, ar artificial colorings and artificial flavorings and artificial smell and um, uh, humectants to keep the food dry, etc. So you're mm -hmm. staying away from some of those negative chemicals, which have been shown many of them to be uh, to, to be um, carcinogenic to cause cancer. For example, let's say. Uh, the dog food company buys a lot of fish mm -hmm. a, 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 um, and the fish has been preserved in ethoxyquin, which, which it often is, or BHT, because it's out on the ship and, you know, instead of keeping it frozen or, you know, very cold, they add preservatives to it. Well, that's part of the mix that the food company got. They, that uh, fact that there's a thoxiquin in there doesn't have to show up on the final label. There's a lot of problems with labeling. So, mm -hmm. you know, you do get a lot of chemicals in your food that uh, besides the ones that are listed. So it's, you know, I think it's uh, animal abuse, uh, the way we feed our animals. Mm -hmm. So if we, um, the, the other aspects are that you want to uh, stay away from foods being cooked because when you cook them, you even if you cook them at a very low temperature, mm -hmm. there are some foods like that, you're still destroying all the bacteria which are important to the microbiome, to the intestinal uh, bacterial population that's very important to the immunity and to the proper functioning of the, uh, the pet's uh, body. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> by um, removing those bacteria, you're doing a disservice then you're also destroying the digestive enzymes. So what I mean by that, they're really called food enzymes. When um, an animal eats, yes, it has its own enzymes, some amylase in its, you know, from its saliva, some animal, and uh, the stomach has enzymes and the intestines and the, uh, you know, the, the, the liver produces bile, and that all is part of the digestive process, but it's not the whole thing. The food itself comes with enzymes. And when you cook food, you destroy that part of digestibility. Mm -hmm. So raw food is a lot more digestible. It has bacteria. Uh, plus, when you cook food as high as it's, as high a temperature as it's cooked for making kibble, you're producing carcinogens, you know, cyclic amines and other things. You're producing uh, allergens from the, you're changing the, the protein. Uh, you're also, um, by um, denaturing the protein, you're making it less digestible. And of course, by knocking out the food enzymes, you're making it less digestible. So now <clears throat> the protein is not properly digested in the body. So extra protein is left in the intestines and the, it, it's turned into ammonia by the bacteria in the intestines. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that ammonia goes to the liver and taxes the liver. And the liver turns it into urea, which taxes or burdens the, the kidneys. So if you have weak kidneys or weak liver, it can easily turn into liver disease or kidney disease. And, um, you know, you could prevent all these things by giving raw food. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of good that way. And um, <clears throat> I was importing from all the way from California to New Jersey, raw food made by Pat McKay. And when she retired, she gave me all of her recipes. So in 2002, I started to make my own raw food just for my clients because I, you know, treasured their pets so much. And... Um, <clears throat> I started to add my own twist to it. I was adding blood to the food because I felt that added life to it. Mm -hmm. I added green tripe to add extra bacteria and digestive enzymes. And so um, I was, you know, I had a unique food. Mm -hmm. Come 2007, I said, wow, this is great. I see my, the animals in my practice doing so much better their coats, their eyes, everything's brighter and they're more active and jumping. In fact, my own dog, uh, um, when I met my wife <laughs> and she 
introduced me to her dog. Her dog was this rickety little thing. And we started to put him on, on the raw food. Uh, and within a oh, couple of weeks, he was jumping. Wow. For his, for you know, every time he wanted to feed him, he was actually jumping off the floor. He, he was, uh, mm-hmm. he so, came back to life. Yeah, he he knows good for him. Yeah. He lost years. Wow. wow. <laughs> so that was that was the the raw food part of it. But then in two thousand, basically about three years ago, I came up with the idea. I think it was my idea. <laughs> probably was that uh, you know there's there's something called functional food ingredients or bioceuticals some people call it mm-hmm. so you've heard of cinnamon and garlic and you know turmeric and uh, all these things adding special medical or biomedical um, uh, functionality you know to the mm-hmm. food it, it actually helps the body function better so what I started to do was add medicinal mushrooms, my taki and shiitake mushrooms. And uh, then I added um, uh, tomatoes, cooked tomatoes to, to give lycopene. So the my taki and shiitake and the lycopene are very good preventatives and even treatments, but mostly good preventative for cancer and autoimmune diseases. And these are the two things that we're seeing so much in medicine and um, and so, gee, if I could help it, help prevent it, uh, it's such a service for the animals and for their owners. So that was really my um, uh, impetus to do that. And then I came up with other ideas like adding garlic and ginger to the food. Ginger helps their, uh, their uh, intestinal system, helps them digest better, prevent GI problems. And uh, the garlic is great for the immune system. And some of your people might know that garlic can be at very high levels, and it's hard to even feed them at that high level, uh, can be toxic. So mm-hmm. we give it at, you know, obviously uh, very safe levels. Okay. So I know one of the, this is, this is also fascinating. Um, so one of the questions that I hear from people, and I am sure people want to know more about, is it, is it safe or the safety of it? I mean, obviously we're doing it and they're doing great, but could you speak to that? People's concerns about the safety with raw feeding? All right. If I start jumping up and down and screaming, you'll know. I I Um, hear you. (laughs) I'm very passionate about this question. And Purina Company has done a really big disservice for the animals. You know, they have made veterinarians throughout the world very worried. It's almost like like back in the 60s, we were worried about the Cold War, about that the whole world would be, you know, irradiated and, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, duck, duck and cover, you know, under your chairs. And, uh, the, the concern is salmonella. Yeah. It's also listeria and E. coli 0157, but uh, mostly salmonella. And veterinarians will often tell their clients that you know don't feed raw food it's dangerous and it's really the opposite Mm -hmm. number one the raw food companies would be out of business if there was salmonella in the food Mm -hmm. number two salmonella doesn't hurt the animals Mm -hmm. Uh, i often joke that you could add salmonella to their food they'd be fine the only animals that would be affected would be those that are have severe immune deficiencies such as animals that are on chemotherapy which I disagree with anyway. Mm-hmm. So none of my patients would be on that. But <clears throat> the, um, uh, the real problem with salmonella, listeria, and E. coli is people, that people handle pet, the pet food. Mm-hmm. And so because for, for human safety, those things are dangerous to a, an extent. Again, would be people that are immune deficient, but, you know, be it what it is, the... Um, the federal government has zero tolerance for salmonella, E. coli, 0157, and listeria. And <clears throat> so, like other raw food feeders, um, we make sure that, that every batch is tested and is free of those things. So that's a non, you know, it's a non-fear uh, or, a, or a non-issue, mm-hmm. and people shouldn't fear it at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, they should fear food that is, uh, that is missing bacteria that is sterile. Okay. 
and with that, do you, do, just to help people know, you know, who have questions about, well, what raw food should I be feeding them? Should I be making it myself? Um, you know, pre-made? How do I know which pre-made is good? Um, what can people... Yeah, well, there you go. Um, it's hard to make any food. I don't care if it's raw or cooked or whatever. To make a food that's well balanced and that it's complete is very difficult. Mm -hmm. I formulate my own food. I've been learning for many years how to do it. Um, it's very difficult, actually, mm -hmm. to get all the nutrients accounted for, to have your fatty acids such that you're giving lots of essential fatty acids that are you know, high in uh, EPAs and DHAs, your omega-3 fatty acids. In other words, you want that to be certain level compared to omega-6s. So it's properly anti-inflammatory rather than pro-inflammatory mm -hmm. um, because that's what you don't want your food to be pro-inflammatory, which again, if you cook it, you're encouraging that. Um, so you'd have to f add a lot of supplements and most supplements are not natural. So it's difficult to, to make your own. So there's a lot of foods out on the market that are raw. And unfortunately, the vast majority of them are really, are, well, they're sterile. Let me put it that way. They are missing bacteria and they have done that through high pressure treatment because the federal government has made it difficult to feed a true raw diet. And I'll have to say that any food that doesn't have plenty of healthy bacteria is not a good thing to feed your, your pet. I think I feel that very strongly. So anything that's high pressure treated, they call it HPP, high pressure pasteurization or high pressure mm -hmm. processing, uh, I would not recommend um, anything that's even partially cooked, I would not recommend because it's missing bacteria and digestive or food enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, so something that's, you know, well balanced and um, complete and um, has bacteria in it is what I'd recommend. It can be frozen mm -hmm. or it can be freeze dried mm -hmm. or it can be um, air dried. So all of them still have the bacteria and, and and, and enzymes and the raw elements all intact. Okay. I was just curious. I, I don't know if you would know this, but if the brands say whether they're high pressure, you know, if it's going to say that if people have to find out for themselves by calling. You do them. have to <laughs> look on the website and, okay. and ask the questions and ask the pet shop owner. Mm -hmm. Okay. With the whole, you know, I have to mention it because I know people have this question too, um, the grain-free uh, topic. Um, oh, again, I'm going to jump up and down and scream. <laughs> okay, another, you know, I guess Purina once was good food, but and maybe some of their food is really good, but they've done a very big disservice in this campaign to talk about uh, grain-free food. Okay, so here's the thing. There's a lot of foods that were out there make, ha having a lot of grain, corn, uh, wheat, because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. And it was subsidized by the federal government. And this all came out of World War II. And so we were feeding things that were really inappropriate for animals. Animals don't get grain. It's just not appropriate. It's so starchy. Mm -hmm. So the public said, oh, we don't want grain. It's not healthy for our pets. So these companies listened. And they realized that all these other companies were coming out with grain free. So they came out with grain free, but they replaced the grain with even more trashy elements. They replaced the grain with potatoes, with even sweet potatoes, tapioca, um, peas, um, uh, rice, things that really were also very inappropriate for animals, but even more inappropriate than the grain mm -hmm. because they were missing two important uh, uh, amino acids. And these amino acids in the dog's body are turned into taurine, which is an, you know, an amino acid uh, that's made out of two other amino acids. And that taurine is very important for the heart health. Mm -hmm. So quite a few dogs um, that 
uh, of breeds that don't usually get uh, cardiomyopathy, or heart disease, were starting to get cardiomyopathy and they were tying it to these grain-free foods. So it wasn't that grain is good, it was that <laughs> these, you know, replacing grain with even worse trash, uh, even less nutritious elements was even worse. Mm -hmm. So um, again, this was, I don't know, it angers me to, to, to know that the animals are now being fed grain again because of this um, mythology that was perpetuated, uh, produced and perpetuated by uh, uh, this campaign of, of Purinas. Right. Jeez. Uh. Well, it's good that we have people like you. Angry. Yeah. Well, it's good to have anger sometimes and you know, able <laughs> well, to. We can teach. Maybe speak a little bit more to to the benefits. I mean, I know. I mean, I can tell people that my animals have been on raw food for a long time and um, do great on it. People compliment them on their their fur and their you know how beautiful their coats and shiny and and all that. But maybe you could speak a little bit more to the you know, the medical benefits and um, of uh, feeding raw. Okay. Um, I guess the most glaring one is that pets live longer. Mm -hmm. In my practice, okay, I was conventional. I looked at my records back then and the average age of death of the patients was a certain age, you know, overall. And then I looked at uh, since 1996, when I you know, came to the bright side and started to uh, uh, feed raw and feed uh, and do chiropractic and all these other things, um, the age of, of passing is now about 40% longer. Wow. Okay. And, 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 you know, some vets say, oh, well, that's because of the vaccines. Well, guess what? We don't do vaccines very much in our practice. Mm -hmm. We give it maybe twice as a puppy or a kitten, and then not again for the whole life. So it's not vaccines, I'll tell you that one. Yeah. Uh, it's by taking the, 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 the dangerous things out of their life and um, uh, giving them, you know, good things in their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and so what are some of those other things? I know um, you do a lot of, give people some guidance on what they can do. At yeah. I have I have a brochure that I give to people if if anybody wants that I guess I'll give the uh, uh, contact information. But inside it we have um, you know guidelines as to what you can do at home to have your pet live a lot longer and prevent uh, chronic diseases. So uh, the three top things, the three most important things to live a longer life and to not get chronic disease uh, are raw food mm -hmm. with bacteria in it, chiropractic adjustments, and dental care. And what I mean by dental care is not necessarily money going to the veterinarian, but, but the owner brushing the teeth every day and mm -hmm. preventing dentistry. Dentistry is also very expensive. Mm -hmm. And of course, so are chronic diseases. So by preventing them by brushing the teeth every day and starting out as a puppy, even when they have their deciduous teeth, you know, their, their temporary teeth, that's when you teach them to uh, cooperate and, and allow brushing. So every day brushing the teeth. So then there's other things. Um, and, and I'll get back to the chiropractic. I had just glossed over that one. So we'll get to... Uh, uh, brush the coat every day by using a soft wire slicker brush. Slicker brushes are the ones with the little bent wires. Mm -hmm. Every day, brush the, the coat with a slicker brush. <clears throat> it actually cleans the coat. It takes out all the dirt particles, so you really don't have to ever give a bath. Mm. It stimulates the glands to produce their oils, so you never get that doggy smell. Wow. You know, those are the reasons people give baths. So no doggy smell, no dirt. Mm -hmm. Why give a bath? because mm -hmm. baths actually are a negative because they um, draw out the oils from the skin and make the skin more itchy and more uncomfortable, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and by brushing, you're also giving a massage, so mm -hmm. you're detoxifying the body every day. Mm -hmm. Great things. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. All very positive 
they're very, uh, very healthy. Um, and right brushing the teeth every day. If there's no uh, tartar on the teeth, if there's no real buildup, then you can use an enzyme toothpaste, which we use in puppies and kittens. But if you're already starting to get that buildup, then you use a toothpaste that has grapefruit seed extract and grape seed extract. So one, you know, the product that I like to carry is Vets Life, V-E-T-Z-L-I-F-E. And I love the company because they are very philanthropic and they help, uh, you know, uh, fund student veterinarians uh, to come to holistic conferences. Um, and, and a third thing besides brushing the teeth and brushing the coat are thumping the thymus. So if the animal is standing on all fours right between its, its armpits, Mm -hmm. There is right on its uh, sternum, you thump it. So if it's a small dog, you use your fingertips. If it's a big dog, you use your fist. And you're stimulating the thymus gland, which is, of course, underneath underneath the, uh, the sternum. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the thymus gland helps control the immunity. And not just stimulating your immunity, you're actually... Um, augmenting or moderating the immunity. You're, you're getting it to work for the animal rather than against it. So you're counteracting some autoimmunity there. So every day, 10 taps, once a day. One time of the day, you hit it for 10 times. Uh, if, if your pet's not that healthy and has immune um, compromise, you know, some kind of challenges, so you can do it twice a day. Mm -hmm. Then also uh, keep the the um, pollution from walking around outside uh, um, under control by wiping the paws when your dog comes back in. Or if you have a cat that goes outside, same thing, wipe those paws. And you don't have to go using soap and water. If you want to, I guess you could, but just with water, just with just plain water. Some people use baby wipes. I actually... Um, discourage that a little bit because that's more chemicals but mm -hmm. just, just water to uh, ha have a, a damp cloth waiting at the door when you come back mm -hmm. um, then vaccines it's appropriate to give vaccines they do save lives they are appropriate as a puppy mm -hmm. a kitten and just usually two vaccines uh, for distemper and parvo <clears throat> maybe um Dr. Jean Dodds of California, she recommends that at nine weeks old and at 14 weeks old for a dog, give the distemper and parvo combination, but not the big combination, not with leptospirosis and parainfluenza and hepatitis, just simple distemper and parvo. And then at 18 weeks, give an additional parvovirus vaccine. Mm -hmm. So that's it with the distemper parvo. And then at six months old, to give the, the rabies vaccine. Mm -hmm. She also recommends that a year and a half old uh, to give another rabies. I don't in my practice. Instead, what I do is a year after the distemper and a year after the first rabies, I just do a blood test. Mm -hmm. And that blood test proves or disproves, which is very rare, that the rabies vaccine is still protecting. And if it's still protecting, why give another one? There's no, there's no reason for it. Uh, it's really, and this is gonna be pretty counterintuitive to a lot of the listeners, by giving vaccines over and over, instead of improving the immunity, it actually suppresses the immunity or worse, causes the body to react against itself. It, mm -hmm. it encourages autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. So staying away from excessive vaccines is very important in my mind. Yeah. So. Once I do that, that vaccine titer, that blood test, then I just repeat it once every three years after that. Okay. And in almost every case, there's some that are not so, but in almost every case, uh, the pet comes up, um, you know, that it has plenty of immunity uh, inferred for, by that the puppy and kitten shots. Right. And then um, parasite control, again, just like staying away from all the chemicals in food, Stay away from the chemicals against fleas and ticks. Mm -hmm. they, a lot of vets will recommend these insecticides that are very harmful. Don't 
uh, minimize the harm that you get from some of these flea and tick products, especially uh, some of the one with, uh, ones with isoxazolines. Uh, these are the, um, um, there's about four or five of them <clears throat> that are made from a chemical or mimics the chemical that sea sponges make to repel or actually to uh, paralyze and kill sea lice. So, you know, it's a very natural, original mm -hmm. idea, but it turns out that a lot of dogs are having severe diseases and even, you know, death from their own immune, their own nervous systems being injured by these chemicals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the old, um, before those came out, all these other, um, flea and tick products that would kill fleas and kill ticks, <coughs> they're toxic. Mm -hmm. They kill dogs and they, they're really, uh, there's been so much, um, so much said about them and you can see it on the internet. Uh, another very important way of protecting your, your pet is to minimize stress. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, simple things like a very good environment, lots of love, uh, music, mm -hmm. um, just things to help them get through the day and, and to, to have a, a calmer life mm -hmm. are very helpful. Yeah. Uh, stress we know is one of the, probably the biggest stimulator, or, or, or I, could, I shouldn't say stimulator, I should say um, a suppressor of the immune system. Stress mm -hmm. really does hurt the immune system because stress encourages the adrenal glands to re to release uh, internal steroids uh, that uh, suppress the immune system. So if we constantly have stress, you're constantly suppressing the immune system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things to help the immune, uh, to help uh, with an especially nervous pet are rescue remedy. Mm -hmm. Give one drop in their mouth four times a day or you could use CBD oil. Mm -hmm. That's uh, one of the newer things. Uh, some pets need stronger um, calming agents, but you know, usually music and and rescue remedy are, are very good for calming. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we'll use the Beamer. It's a, something that's not on topic for today, but there's a a certain. Um, uh, medical device that helps to calm animals because it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, something called the Beamer. Mm -hmm. um, and also sometimes we'll use things like lavender aromatherapy mm -hmm. to calm an animal. So just like um, people with headaches, sometimes one remedy will work and other times another remedy will work. Well, the same thing with pets. Sometimes rescue remedy is not enough. You know, Bach flowers are not enough and uh, CBD might not be enough, and maybe aromatherapy is the thing. So whatever, whatever it is, you find out for your pet by, by trial and error. And right. yeah, patience, I think. That's the thing that I, I think if people can kind of go into looking at holistic care for their pets is don't expect maybe the, you know, the big boom, like, huge change overnight is just going to happen with one pill kind of, you know, you might have to do some trial and error, but in the long run, it's worth it uh, mm -hmm. because of the lack of side effects and other, you know, just long-term problems that some things can cause. And, and I'm wondering people who are interested in holistic care, I mean, obviously the easiest thing is probably just to go to a holistic vet and then you don't have this problem. But for people that have vets that they like, or they've, they've been with for many years and they trust and they maybe, you know, don't want to change. Um, how do you suggest that they approach some of these things? For instance, feeding, I know I've had clients tell me, uh, you know, I brought that up with my vet and he just went crazy. He told me it was going to kill my dog. You know, <laughs> do you have any suggestions for people who are? Hmm. Have... Well, <laughs> <laughs> this is a two-edged sword that I'm going to mention, and that is to to, to look on the internet <laughs> and to to learn. Um, mm -hmm. I've had I've had quite a few clients <coughs> learn on their own 
there's companies like um, uh, Young Living and doTERRA and others where they teach aromatherapy. And aromatherapy is very, very empowering. Um, uh, homeopathy courses, a lot of clients have taken that and they learn how to treat their own families uh, with, with both of those things. It's funny that um, uh, they actually interfere with each other. You don't use homeopathy with aromatherapy because the aromatherapy will actually neutralize homeopathic remedies. Mm -hmm. uh, but one or the other works very nicely or, or use, you know, enough apart work very nicely. Um, so, and, and of course, advocating for your pet by, yeah, looking things up. Your pet has, um, I don't know, let's say a hormonal imbalance, Cushing's disease, or has uh, a knee problem, you know, anterior cruciate ligament that is torn a bit and they're still able to put a little tiny pressure every once in a while, but it's not where they need surgery. You know, a lot of in fact, when I was a conventional vet, I loved doing knee surgery. I still love it, but I only do maybe one or two a year. I used to do one or two a week. Uh, but now by doing chiropractic, I found that I can treat most of these cases mm, uh, without, good. yeah, without medicine and without uh, surgery. Um, so really just learning the, the, um, uh, you know, different different uh, uh, approaches, different modalities that are out there that might, uh, you know, help in your pet's case. And so I do find quite a few people, they love their vets and they want to go for them, to go to them for the regular checkups because I have to say that is one of the most important things a vet can do because they're trained to see things that, you know, most people won't even see. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of my clients, they'll get the diagnosis from their, from their regular vet, they'll get their regular exam from the regular vet, but once they come up with a diagnosis, they'll come to me because they want it approached in a, in a uh, more natural way. Okay. Yeah. I was going to talk about chiropractic, if, if I may. Yes, definitely. Because in 1997, that's, that just opened my whole world. Um, Dr. Bill Inman out in Idaho, actually he traveled around the country and set up uh, courses everywhere. I learned it in Philadelphia. And <clears throat> I think I have saved more lives uh, by doing chiropractic than, than just about any other modality. Wow. Uh, and it's so natural. You're not doing anything to the animal that's not natural. You are, what you're doing is, you know, a little bit of a, of a push on its spine using an instrument <clears throat> or doing it manually. There's different methods of chiropractic, but chiropractic basically, remember I said it was one of those three pillars of health, mm -hmm. keeping the teeth clean, giving healthy food, but chiropractic is a third that is, is necessary for an animal to live a lot longer and, and uh, get fewer chronic diseases. Um, so the research showed, Dr. Bill Inman himself did this in the 1960s and 70s, I think it was a 15 or 16 year research project. And there were about 15,000 dogs involved in the project. And he determined that if an animal gets chiropractically adjusted, they will live 28 and a half percent longer. Wow. That's, that's just a no brainer. Run to your chiropractor, <laughs> at least for animals. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just um, compelling, yeah. that, that kind of information. Mm -hmm. So yes, they live a lot longer, plus they're a lot less likely to get chronic diseases, hormonal imbalances, um, even even things like uh, anterior cruciate ligament ruptures, you know, we say, oh, that's an injury, but guess what? There's an underlying weakness there that you might have prevented by giving good food and, and chiropractic. Mm -hmm. um, it's shown pretty clearly that even if you get a puppy and it's 
parents both had certain diseases like hip dysplasia, that chiropractic may prevent that hip dysplasia from ever expressing itself. Wow. Okay. Isn't that amazing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and there's a lot of things like that where chiropractic can prevent a lot of diseases, even if the animal is genetically predisposed. That's great. So it's it's my favorite go-to. It's, you know, if I'm treating cancer, if I'm treating, um, you know, musculoskeletal problems or hormonal imbalances or even a cough, you know, I'll, I'll very often or, or almost always include chiropractic as a base mm -hmm. because what you're doing is you're turning on all those nerve switches along the back. You're, you're taking those ganglia, if you remember high school biology, <laughs> you're turning those ganglia back on and those ganglia are the nerve switches. They're where nerves come together and mm -hmm. trade the nerve uh, impulse from one nerve to the other, from the central uh, nervous system to the rest of the body. So if those switches are all turned on, which they're not in most animals, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you can keep them all turned on, then the body can communicate much better inside mm -hmm. and it can um, prevent chronic diseases because a lot of chronic diseases are due to poor communication in the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, besides other things like uh, toxins, that's another reason you get chronic diseases, but the poor communication can be overcome by um, by that. Yeah. By and chiropractic. Yeah, and just as a, a pet parent and animal communicator, I know that after my animals have an adjustment, they are they're just more balanced emotionally, just in a better place, more relaxed. I'm I'm curious, do you have you seen the field of holistic veterinary you know medicine going is it getting bigger? Have you seen it really growing? Have you seen any trends in it? Um, yeah, it's it's easier to hire holistic vets now. I okay. I used to really really have to struggle to find a holistic vet. It's okay. not that it's easy, but it's easier. Okay. Um, and the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, when I was um, the president in two thousand five. <laughs> I made a pledge to increase our our numbers, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we did so by uh, becoming part of the American Veterinary Medical Association. We had joined their House of Delegates uh, soon after I was president, but I got that ball rolling, and more and more vets have joined the uh, the field of holistic medicine, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this is a, a good question you asked, Dan, because on Saturday I ran into a, an old friend of mine, a, a vet, and uh, I said, gee, and I'm looking for a vet right now to join my practice. Why don't you uh, consider it? And she said, Jerry, I'm not a holistic vet. In fact, I'm kind of against holistic medicine. And I said, well, do you use glucosamine and chondroitin for joints? She said, yeah. I said, well, do you use Denimarin, you know, with milk thistle for uh, for liver diseases? She says, yeah. And how about Yunnan Baiyao, which is a Chinese medicine for cancer of the spleen and the liver when you have hemangiosarcoma uh, she said, yeah, or any kind of internal bleeding? She said, yeah. I said, well, you're already practicing holistic medicine. And a lot of conventional vets are using laser which is holistic medicine. They're all alternative treatments. And more and more, um, you know, alternative treatments are becoming mainstream. So I, in a sense, uh, hopefully we're softening the world to be more open and yeah. more vets um, realizing that there's benefits to it and getting curious to find out more. Are there schools of holistic, like divisions of certain? Okay. <laughs> I wish. I okay. wish. Well, <laughs> let me put it this way. Um, Colorado State University is open. They were probably the first ones to be open to holistic medicine, and they started acupuncture way back when. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gainesville, University of Florida is teaching acupuncture. Um, I think a lot of the vet schools are just dabbling 
they're okay. just getting, and they'll they'll have one holistic vet on their on their staff and things like that. So yeah, slowly, it's getting incorporated. Okay, it still it kind of boggles my mind that it's not a little bit more a little further at this point, but I'm I'm happy mm. to hear that that it's at least expanding and. Well, I didn't expect it to even go this quickly. I think it's. And, and really, it's driven by pet owners. Mm, so that's the thing, yes. The more pet owners that approach their vets and say, hey, I've heard about something that works. <laughs> right, right. You know? So and, those watching, you got to speak up those pamphlets that Dr. B mentioned. Uh, you can go to, I guess, your website yeah. there at holisticpetcarenj.com. Right. Well, so this one's about the veterinary practice and about how you can help your animal at home. So this is just the practice brochure. And then this is about the, the, the dog food that I make, the, the longevity dog food. It's called Raw Made Better. And it's, um, the, the website for that is drbslongevity.com. So drbslongevity.com. And, and that's links on the website too, right? You can go to your main You website. can go to the website. You can call the practice at 973-256-3899 and have us mail them to you too. Okay. And is your food only sold in New Jersey or is it? Uh... At the moment, it's only in this area of the country. So it's Pennsylvania, Maryland, the top of uh, Virginia, um, New Jersey, Delaware, I said Delaware, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, Connecticut, and New York. Okay. So, but it, it will be expanding all the way across the country and perhaps even to India because wow. we have some contacts there who want to carry it. But what's going to happen is that'll be more possible when we make a uh, an air-dried version of our food. It's easier to ship, mm -hmm. it's easier for pet owners. Mm -hmm. um, the mistake a lot of people uh, don't, don't realize, um, when they buy the um, air-dried food, that it's such concentrated nutrition that they pay a lot for a little bit. Well, that's because all the water is taken out. So okay. if you add the water mm -hmm. and you have all that good nutrition, you have a lot of meals in the little bag and people are just shy of spending that much money on this little bag, right. but it's actually equivalent to a huge bag. Okay, got it. Is there anything else that we didn't cover? Um. You know, just, I mean, really just be open, just uh, uh, use your heart, really, use your head, use your heart, and uh, just be open to things. And you'll realize that there's a lot out there. There's a lot out there. I just learned a couple of weeks ago of this uh, medical doctor in Italy that looks at things very differently, um, cancer and many other diseases that uh, may be due to the natural um, candida albicans yeast in our body, fu fungus in our body. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> by changing the pH of our body, we may be able to combat a lot of things that we don't realize uh, are, are uh, fixable. Yeah. Um, that's in humans, but it probably also applies to animals, but it's just a matter of being open and listening and being interested to, to delve deeper and just not, shun things before you know uh, that uh, that they don't work. Because there are things that come up that maybe are not worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. But um, just be open and, and uh, get educated. Yeah. Have your heart in it because you love those animals. Yeah, that's that's the, the key. The, the key factor is how much we love our animals and we're willing to. If you're here, you probably want to figure out how you can do everything you can to help them live longer. We, we do appreciate you coming and helping us to understand some some more about what we can do to help our animals and some, some new ideas. And as always, if anyone wants to reach out to me for more information, about, please feel free to go to my website, intuitivetouchanimalcare.com or Anne at intuitivetouchanimalcare.com is my email. Um, so Dr. B, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and um thank you, you know, we'll have you back sometime to, to talk more about some other interesting topics if you if you'd be interested so thank you for all you do for animals oh absolutely love them